think the subject is very close to my heart. So when I was asked to come and speak about this, it didn't take me much persuasion uh, to come here. Um, Arun, I want to compliment you for uh, what you've been doing. I think your conclave is certainly going to be a place where ideas would get generated. And this particular subject of uh, India tomorrow, uh, the way you've dealt with India today, if you address India tomorrow, uh, I'm sure you'll make it a success. Uh, 60 years, next year is going to be 60 years after independence. And I definitely is one, uh, am one who uh, would readily hang one's head in shame that our generation uh, has still left a very large part of our work unfinished. You just heard the statistics that were given to you, uh, whether it's 25% or 30% uh, below the poverty line or living at the margin, uh, the condition of sanitation, uh, the uh, morbidity, the, the, the issues related to you know, not, not having a roof on your head. And most of it is, is in rural India. 72% uh, of India really uh, resides there. And we cannot hope to be a developed country unless we address the issues of development uh, in uh, rural India. Of late, there has been a lot of buzz about India. People are talking about uh, India being on the high growth path. We ourselves have unshackled our thinking. We now talk about trend rate of growth going between 8 and 10 percent. And one way of getting, bridging this divide, a first necessary condition, it may not be a sufficient condition, is to get very high rates of growth. And one of the reasons why people assume that, or people have forecasted that India is going to be growing very fast and it is a happening place is because of India's demographics. We are a young society and up to the middle of the century, the number of people who are going to be of the age that they can engage in a productive job is going to be on the increase. And the people who are going to be dependent on this working population are going to be fewer. So the dependency ratio is going to be more and more favorable as we go towards the middle uh, of the century. But the challenges of this divide are absolutely huge because rural India, the way it is not very well connected, 87% of our villages are with population density of fewer than 2,000 people. And no single agency finds it economically feasible to deliver goods or services below a population of 5,000 people. So many of the people are really not connected to markets. And it is very evident that government has a very large role to play. Similarly, the NGOs, because it is the building of capacity, they also have a very large role to play. I am not competent to comment on whether all the NGOs deliver what they set out to do, or whether all the NGOs are led by people who are passionate and committed and whether there is a governance reform required or there needs to be a regulatory environment related to the NGO sector, I'm not very competent to say. But I think the comment that was made earlier, that all organs of our society need to put their shoulder to the wheel, and that we together have to change things for India and for the Indian society. And definitely, business can play a very large role because business has 
the resources. But unfortunately, business leaders and businesses are measured somewhat unidimensionally, uh, if I might say so, with regard to the context of our subject. Financial performance is the one that takes center stage. The balance sheets of all the companies, what do they tell you? They give you various financial ratios. The stock market gets excited about whether a company performs financially or not. The balance sheets rarely tell you some of the intangible assets that are even more important, the ones that drive that economic performance, the vision, the values, the vitality of the organization, the quality of its distributed leadership, a whole host of intangible assets that drive a company forward. So what can business do to help bridge this divide? I think the first thing the business must do is to be able to stand on its own two feet in a globalizing environment. Each business needs to make sure that it is internationally competitive. And that itself can take a huge amount of resources, imagination, uh, organizational capability to be able to just do that. Then what else can business do? I have one belief, and you heard what ITC is doing. My belief is that there is no contradiction between securing competitive capability and making a true commitment to serve society. As a matter of fact, my belief is that businesses can create value both for society and for the shareholder, and that if you approach the business in its contribution in a comprehensive manner, which I would like to term as a contribution to the triple bottom line, not only profit and return on assets, but ensuring that the way you work, you are nurturing natural capital, and you are growing natural capital, or at least not destroying it or minimizing its destruction. Uh, you know that India, in, if it has to have sustainable development, uh, India has issues related to quality of its air, quality of its soil, quality of its water. And you just heard that somebody is talking about uh, Coca-Cola and so on. I don't wish to offer a comment on that, the merits of that issue. But definitely there are issues related to conditions of soil, air, water, uh, biodiversity. Of course, we want to grow at a fast rate. I said that is an essential condition. That's a necessary condition. Then energy security is one major criterion. And if we were to become developed, uh, one estimate is if India were to have per capita incomes like that of the OECD countries, half the global emissions would be accounted for by India. And therefore, for sustainable development, to ensure that high rates of growth can be sustained, we need to make sure that there is policy framework and there is, there is a partnership between government, uh, all organs of society, but since the subject is confined to government, NGOs, and business, there has to be partnership in dealing with, with that. So coming back to the belief that you can actually maximize contribution to both society. You can, you can maximize contribution to the triple bottom line, and that the three elements of the triple bottom line, contributing to society, contributing to ecology, and contributing to economy, can actually be these three elements can be synergized to get a larger output than the sum of the parts. So that is a belief. But what does it require? What it requires is, of course, vision and values of an organization. Of course, it requires inspired leadership. Because 
at the moment there is no market for such an approach assuming somebody delivers enormous amount of uh, employment uh, and has a business model that can create multiplier impact on the economy and that these three elements of the triple bottom line are the three forms of assets are built but the financial markets only reward you if you produce that profit so one of the things and you forgot to mention media maybe perhaps you did mention media it has an important role to play because any any contribution that is made to society can be converted into the financial dimension if civil society if consumers and if investors begin to reward those companies by making a choice while making investment or making a choice while consuming products goods and services if they prefer those companies everything being equal those contribute to the triple bottom line then there would be a reward then it is not necessary that only people who are very passionate or very committed uh, who who would like to engage in this particular uh, path but this is what we really need to do that our policy framework our reforms the education of our society to demand from business not only financial performance but creating value for society i will give you a small illustration we, when we engage in question and answers i can if somebody doesn't know what each of all is all about and but i'll give you another illustration my company what is in the paper business and in the mid 90s uh, it had to make a choice because it was deeply in the red and uh, it had to make a choice whether it remains in that business basically because india's forest cover is very low the access to fibrous raw material is relatively poor and it is very energy in intensive so if you were to become internationally competitive you had to make sure that there was a source of fiber that was internationally competitive and there was a source of energy that was cost effective and internationally competitive you know that in india energy costs 4 and 1/2 rupees to 5 rupees whereas internationally it could be lower than 5 cents so there was a method there had to be a method of competing on that score and then there was a choice available that you could import pulp because government when they found that our forests were getting eroded they said that don't fell trees from the forest a good idea and you can import pulp but nobody said that you could actually create a farm forestry program through which you could give employment to many people so driven by this idea of the triple bottom line we went ahead and mobilized tribals with private wasteland to help them in silvicultural practices and mobilize them to grow trees in the economic vicinity of the mill and as a result of which we have almost 400000 people mostly of the tribal variety the disadvantaged ones who are employed and it is our vision that in the not too distant future we'll have more than a million people getting sustainable employment and you know if you grow trees you cut it in every 5 year cycle then for 5 years those trees sequester carbon and they help the recharge of the underground water resource and has a favorable salubrious uh, 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 Im impact on the environment and and go to create the much needed natural natural capital so this is integrated into a business model so fundamentally the message that i want to give is that if you if we can create a system whereby 
consumers and investors could reward those companies that create a larger impact on society by creating a triple bottom line. And if we could urge businesses to voluntarily declare their contribution to the triple bottom line, and if you could bring a system of transparency in this respect, and we could motivate consumers and investors in exercising their preferred choice for products and goods and services of those companies that make a significant contribution to society, then we will create an environment in which it would be rewarding to bridge this divide and that companies and businesses would use their very vital resources of managerial capability and financial resources to embark on projects that are not looking for returns in the short run, that take a longer term view, that create a desire in, 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 in to be able to recognize for that long term contribution, go the extra mile and make a contribution to the society. And some of the work that we are doing in this area is with NGOs uh, and in collaboration with Andhra government. So it is possible, really, to be able to mobilize this. The Ichopal project, we have aspirations. We are almost serving 3 million farmers. And uh, we want to continue to do that. And in the next 10 years, serve 100,000 villages. And many more people uh, need to get mobilized in this particular direction. I just want to tell you that ITC has not performed uh, badly in financial terms. And I do believe that this approach of creating incomes in rural India helps create markets. And if you are close to those markets, as indeed we are through our e-chop oil model and through our silvicultural extension practices, then we would be there in a position of trust to be able to serve this markets of tomorrow and be able to reward our shareholders better than many others who may not have taken a long-term view of business and a, long view and, and a creative model that serves both shareholders and serves society in equal measure. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening to me. Dear friends, uh, I'll be mostly uh, speaking from my experience uh, at the grassroots, uh, mostly from UP. And I'm glad that India Today has provided an opportunity where I can share the kind of things that I'll be sharing with you in the next 10 to 15 minutes, because I think these issues are very important and do not get the kind of attention they should. So we have recently signed a nuclear deal with the US, and uh, we are willing to uh, experiment, not experiment, we have already been producing nuclear and power from nuclear energy, but uh, we, are, we are preparing to go in a big way in this direction. But uh, this technology is, has been rejected by most of the developed nations in the world, except for uh, France and Japan, who do not have any alternative sources of energy. Most of the uh, developed nations, the US itself, Canada, England, Germany, have not set up a single nuclear power plant in the last 20 years. Australia, which is the, probably the biggest supplier of uranium, does not have a nuclear power plant, we should ask the question, why? And we have to be careful of getting into this because uh, it is too costly and an aspect which nobody likes to talk about, the uh, dangers uh, of the radiation. We don't know. I mean, nobody knows in the world how to dispose of radioactive waste, and still we are willing to go into this uh, this is suspicious. Uh, it is probably fueled by our ambition to become some kind of uh, uh, powerful nation in the global community. 
probably a seat in the Security Council or something like that. But on the other hand, we must also see that our government, uh, more than 59 years after independence, uh, fails to provide the most basic security to its citizens. On one hand, we have McDonald's and Pizza Huts offering a variety of exotic food to the class created during the regime of new economic policy, which can afford to buy any product in the international market. People in our country living below poverty line uh, are denied their due share of 35 kilograms of food grains per day at subsidized rates because there is a massive siphoning off of food grains uh, by the food mafia in collusion with politicians and officials, forcing people to live in extreme situations of poverty and even hunger. I would like to show you uh, what a typical ration card of a person belonging to below poverty line looks like. Can we have the picture here? Now, what you see here is a picture of a below poverty line ration card. This particular one belongs to a person called Santu, who's resident of Chamarkhera, in village Bangalpur in Hardoi district of UP. He's a landless Dalit, who also happens to be visually challenged. This ration card does not sh show a single grain of food given to him during the past eight years. So uh, the second uh, picture will show you what the inside of the ration card looks like. He got some sugar and some kerosene in 1998. And after that, all his pages are blank. I have the original ration card here with me. And this is not an exception. Most of the ration cards of the below poverty line category would look like this, with blank pages. The food grains which are being sent for the poor people are not reaching the poor. Last two years have witnessed over 40 starvation deaths in UP. And we have seen farmers committing suicides in relatively prosperous states like Punjab and Andhra Pradesh because of their inability to repay loans. And these are recent phenomena in these regions. I would like to put up the pictures of two ladies uh, who appeared in a public hearing on 20th December 2005 in Gorakhpur. Uh, these ladies, Shubhavati and Prabhavati, have lost their husbands uh, because of hunger. They belong to Musahar caste, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which lives mostly in Eastern UP and Bihar. And the name Musahar derives from the fact that they uh, take out the grains which are stored by rats in the fields, and that is, that is how they sustain themselves. So uh, uh, the uh, husbands, Shivnath and Nagina Musahar, died in the last 17 months, both in Kushinagar district of UP. Most government loans meant for the poor end up in the hands of officials and middlemen, further jeopardizing the lives of the poor. We now have an Employment Guarantee Act, which is supposed to guarantee 100 day, days of uh, employment to people in 200 districts of the country. But there doesn't seem to be any guarantee yet. The contractors continue to maintain a stranglehold over public works. In this act, contractors are forbidden from undertaking work. Machines are engaged. We uh, should not have machines, but machines are being employed. And it's very interesting that the first Employment Guarantee Act in the country, 58 uh, years after independence, uh, forbids machines. And we should remember how Mahatma Gandhi had opposed the mindless industrialization uh, because he thought that it would make people uh, uh, people will not have jobs. Full and timely payment of wages still remains an elusive dream. For example, UP has 58 rupees of minimum wage, but I haven't seen anybody getting 58 rupees for eight hours of work per day, either in per, uh, private work or government work. 
and muster rolls, which are a record of the labor work, continue to be fabricated away from the eyes of the public. They are the, one of the biggest sources of corruption in any uh, construction-related work, and they make a complete mockery of this act. The food grains as part of the Food for Work program also do not reach the laborers, and there's a big scam related to food grains meant for the poor going on in this country, which should be a matter of national shame because it perpetually scuttles the poverty alleviation programs. Recently, 22 trucks of food grains belonging to public distribution system uh, meant for Kushinagar district in UP, which were being diverted were caught in the neighboring Devariya district by the district magistrate of Koshinagar. And in spite of the district magistrate having identified 12 officials and eight contractors, can we have the next picture, please? Most of them by their names as culprits, no action has been taken against most of them. So, so this gives you an, an idea of what goes on. This is the last page of the report which uh, has been uh, filed by the district magistrate to the UP government, the chief secretary and the food commissioner, and it recommends action against the errant officials and contractors, but so far no action has been taken. This is a very recent thing. This uh, report is dated 3rd of January, 2006. The resistance by the bureaucracy to give up its control, lack of transparency, and no possibility of democratic intervention by the people ensures the fail failure of poverty elevation measures of the government. The number of ration cards, for example, meant for the poor in a village, gets decided not by the village panchayat, which is the elected body, but by the block level official. And similarly, uh, the public works which are undertaken uh, are decided by officials and not by the people. And uh, one of my friends has become a Gram Pradhan in Varanasi district. He was recently told to reduce the number of below poverty line ration cards by three in his village. Probably a measure adopted by the government to reduce poverty. Now let me come to uh, uh, an, another important area of uh, right of citizens over natural resources. Um, Whereas the amount of water in our rivers and canals continues to deplete, instead of thinking of ways of conserving water and maintaining our water tables, we are pushing ideas like interlinking of rivers, mega projects, which will only further facilitate commercial exploitation of water. The poor farmers are arm twisted to pay for using water from canals, which have dried up long ago. Uh, can we have the next picture, please? Uh, these are two uh, receipts from 2005, where farmers from Hirupur Gutaya village in Hardoi district of UP were forced to pay for water which they never used. This is a common practice, by the way, in the, in the villages, where the irrigation department and the revenue department force people to pay money, uh, and if they don't pay, they end up in jail. They are given a, a notice, and then they are sent to jail. Therefore, people end up paying all this money. So on, on one hand, we have a situation like this, where water is not being let into canals because the irrigation department says that they don't have enough water. But on the other hand, we allow Coca-Cola and Pepsi to indulge in massive exploitation of underground water from over 90 locations throughout the country. And farmers in Plajimada, Kerala, and Mehdi Ganj, Varanasi, are putting up valiant struggles to save their water being taken away every day by the multinational corporations. Slowly, people are losing control over natural resources which belong to them since time immemorial, resources like water, land, forest, minerals. And now the latest blow is ban on common salt, forcing people to buy iodized salt at five times more the cost whereas the fact is that only a small area of the country is deficient in iodine. When tobacco and soft drinks with high levels of pesticides in it are allowed to be sold freely in the market, what possible health hazard common salt, which, is, which has been consumed by people for ages, can pose is beyond comprehension. From 15th of May, uh, common, consumption of common salt will, will become illegal. 
everybody will have to uh, take iodized salt. And I don't know of any country in the world which has this kind of policy, uh, making iodized salt compulsory. The new economic policy has pushed us in a direction where the poor seem to be becoming immaterial for the decision-making class. The development priority for the well-off class seems to have completely overtaken the interests of the marginalized class, as evident from telecom revolution, infrastructure development, where you have highways meant only for four-wheel motorized vehicles. I mean, how many people in our country travel in four-wheel motorized vehicles? And privatization of most services meant for common people, for example, healthcare, which is really excluding them. We have chosen a development model to create islands of prosperity and oceans of deprivation. And this seems to be an inter internationally emerging scenario, irrespective of the place of the nation in the hierarchy according to the Human Development Index. Is this the globalized world that we want to create? When the government in the country does not act in the interest of the common people, the people will have to force the government to become accountable to them. NGOs and corporations have only marginal role to play. It is people's organizations which will have to assert their democratic rights, seeking participation in the decision-making process, as well as creating a role for themselves in monitoring the implementation of policies. A relentless struggle needs to be carried on to free the system from the clutches of the politicians, bureaucracy, contractors, mafia, nexus on one hand, and corporations and international monetary agencies on the other to transfer the control in the hands of the common people. In effect, we are talking of democratizing our democracy through strong local people's movements. Thank you.